So our first speaker then is Chow Teana Miner, and Ta Chow is a Kenyan digital heritage specialist and digital humanities scholar working at the intersection of culture and technology. Her work focuses on the application of technology and the preservation, engagement and dissemination of African heritage. Chow is founder of African Digital Heritage and a co-founder of the Museum of British Colonialism and a co-founder of the Open Restitution Africa project. Chow is also a recipient of the Google Anita Borg Scholarship for Women in Technology. And we're absolutely delighted and honored that she's joining us today. Chow, um, I'd invite you to turn your camera on, unmute yourself, and I shall hand over to you. Thank you very much, Finn, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Chao Tayana Maina, as you've heard. I am joining you from Nairobi, Kenya. I am a black woman. I have uh, braids and I'm wearing a very colorful top, which is brown and black because earth tones are my favorite color. And it's wonderful to be here today. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. If at all you have any problems uh, viewing it, do let me know kindly. Today I'm going to be talking about digital infrastructure and um, how it relates both to digital innovation in an inclusive and community-centered way. Uh, the material that I will be sharing is mostly rooted um, on several projects that I have done here in Kenya and in the wider kind of African cultural landscape as a digital heritage specialist, as a historian, and as someone who's passionate about cultural representation, particularly in the digital age. I'm going to start off uh, with this quote by Ikiyos that says that fighting for the future has always been an act of persistence uh, of the desire to live. Now, I start uh, my keynote lecture with this because I do believe strongly that the work of um, digital technologies, particularly in relation to cultural heritage, to history and memory work, is not just about um, rooting ourselves in an understanding of the past, but actually allowing or, or envisioning ways in which this digital technology can itself be a path towards um, alternative futures and new imaginations of, of, of what our future could look like. In 2019, 2018, I founded African Digital Heritage, which is a nonprofit organization uh, that looks to provide critical, holistic, and knowledge-based approaches to digital heritage in Africa. Now, the inspiration for this was um, coming from the point of view of looking at the ways in which digital heritage is rapidly um, changing cultural engagement, particularly outside kind of dominant forms of um, colonial representation, um, access to physical infrastructure, such as archives and museums um, being very inequitable, but also looking at the ways in which younger generations of Africans, of Kenyans are pushing for um, models and, and engagement and frameworks of historical representation that um, suit them and that are more defined um, and essentially designed to cater for their humanity um, instead of the lack thereof. Now, the numbers by, by any, any chance are quite um, astounding and intimidating. By 2050, two in every five children born will be born in Africa. And by 2100, half of the world's youth, half of the world's youth will be African. Now, what does this mean when kind of cultural representations, historical representations are not equitable in the digital age? And we are expecting kind of digital technologies and the internet to be, you know, our primary source of information. And so African digital heritage really steps in to kind of understand how are we going to make this cultural data accessible, how are we going to make it um, equitable, how are we going to make it sustainable, and finally, how are we going to make it cater for the audience, um, not just in, in form of access, but also in form of challenging misrepresentations and bias that have existed within history. Our, our core forms of um, work are digitization, research, innovation, and capacity building. 
And some of the major projects that we've worked on, which inform the work that I'm going to speak about today, are uh, a, a digital museum, um, no objects, no physical location, um, and it's a volunteer run initiative called the Museum of British Colonialism, um, a project around mapping restitution data across the African continent, how many objects have come back, how many requests have been initiated, what are the responses to these requests, and what are the cultural shifts in terms of data access, um, how is that affecting restitution and return of cultural heritage. And finally, kind of made up major projects, um, which is one of my earliest projects to document railway infrastructure or the history of railway infrastructure here in Kenya. Now through this kind of very wide ranging projects, I have had both the privilege um, and the opportunity to really understand what digital innovation could do for cultural heritage, but also kind of what are the challenges and critical questions that we need to be thinking of. The first thing, uh, rather the first thing I will look at is memory. Um, if therefore we are going to sin, then we must sin quietly. Uh, this is a quote from uh, the former Attorney General of Kenya um, in the 1950s in a letter where he notes that human rights are being breached in the struggle for independence in Kenya, yet um, we must sit quietly. So he's talking about particularly the period of uh, 1952 to 1960, in which the colonial government set up a wide-scale network of camps across Kenya um, to detain people who are suspected um, of being part of the Mau Mau Freedom Movement, uh, which was an uprising calling for the return of freedom and land here in Kenya. Now, what happens after Kenya gains independence is that a lot of the information about these camps, on the left, you can see kind of where they're located, um, sort of vanishes out of national memory. I say vanish, but vanishes is kind of abstracting the fact that um, the erasure of this history was very deliberate both on the part of the colonial government and the newly independent Kenya government. Uh, within the scale of detention and camps, uh, there were almost 800 villages set up in central Kenya, 1 million women and children detained, and roughly kind of 150,000 people in detention camps, so outside the concentrated villages. As a Kenyan who has grown up in Kenya and who has experienced the public education system, it was very shocking for me to come across this information much later in, in, in my late 20s. Um, what is more interesting is that these structures of detention, the archives surrounding this period of time are not accessible here in Nairobi and are very hard to access in the UK themselves. And so we began kind of challenging ourselves to imagine ways of curating and preserving memory um, and disseminating this history through digital technologies. Uh, through this, we have begun creating digital reconstructions in 2D and 3D of how these detention camps looked, of how the villages looked. Now, this process is not just about making information accessible. You see, the colonial imagination says that we should be grateful uh, for the knowledge that we have and we should not challenge it and we should not go beyond and ask questions. In this project, we are going um, to the communities, we are traveling to the sites of these detention camps and we're interviewing um, veterans and people who experience these this sites firsthand to help us imagine what they look like. Now, remember that we have very limited access to archives um, and we have very limited access to kind of the visual representations of what these sites would, would have looked like. Uh, and so we are creating this digital reconstructions um, to enable Kenyans to, one, understand that um, this, is, this is very much a part of Kenyan history, to be able to have a visual um, narrative and visual element um, to this particular period. And three, to be able to use this data, which often come with licensing and copyright restrictions uh, in film, in education, and in, in, in gaming and the likes. So these are examples of um, 3D reconstructions of the uh, concentrated villages in central Kenya, many of which were either brought down or burnt down or destroyed when Kenya gained independence. This is a trench surrounding the village and you can see kind of the spikes uh, that surround it. Uh, this is another visual representation of what the digital 
of what the, the detention villages look like. So here you can see the progression of from archive to visual imagery or 3D reconstruction. And we also see this as a form of learning um, to enable audiences, students who are uh, working in different disciplines to be able to take part in this kind of virtual reconstruction. What's interesting about this work is that it, I think it, it really shows that memory does not exist because um, archives and museums and libraries exist. Memory exists because memory is embodied in, in human beings. It is persistent, it is living. And therefore the work of archives and galleries and museums is not to constrain memory, but to enable memory um, to live. Um, to, to be accessible, to grow into something else, to be challenged um, and to be useful to, to different populations and different generations. What you see here on the left is a picture of uh, the detention, one of the detention camps in central Kenya when it was current, when it was still in use. And on the right, you can see um, some of these structures which exist today um, because the detention camp was turned into, into a school, but some of the structures exist. And so we're kind of um, breaking down the linearity of time to show that memory work, digital work, innovation is really about drawing connections. It's really about understanding how spaces and memory and history and archives have evolved. So this project, um, which I have talked about very, very briefly, kind of raises questions for me around digital infrastructure. When we think of digital infrastructure, a lot of the times we think of the, the server, the software, the content management system, the Excel sheet, the laptop. But I want to challenge us, and I, and I like to challenge um, myself as well, to think about digital infrastructure um, being more than the technology, more than the equipment, and that this practice of building sustainable digital futures and sustainable digital projects is also about digital thinking, uh, digital practice, and digital futures. And these questions all come into play when we decide to start a digitization project. Uh, for me, digital infrastructure also embodies uh, kind of four main things. Um, viewing communities as part of, of infrastructure viewing knowledge systems and indigenous knowledge um, as part of digital infrastructure. Um, we have the tech and we kind of have the policies and the resources that are allocated to support digital infrastructure. And uh, this, is, this is informed largely by work that I have done, but also kind of the gaps that I am witnessing when I work with museums, when I work with libraries around how we envision the place of digital technology for our societies for our audiences, for our students, researchers, etc. And so some of the questions that I feel we should be asking ourselves um, within this kind of practice of digital thinking is why do we digitize really? What is the intention of all the tons of data and gigabytes that we are generating? Who are we digitizing for? How do they access it? How do they know that this material is online? How do they use it? How do they challenge it? How do they um, generate conversation uh, between themselves, but also between collections? Um, who are we digitizing for? And finally, how can digitization, digital work, digital practice really enhance um, our understanding of the past, but also give us the opportunity to, to challenge um, and to imagine kind of digital thinking as a, as a freedom to, to look at the past in several ways. And of course, at this point in time, it's also important to note that digital collections also bear with them the same complexities, nuances, um, biases and, and inequalities that physical collections have. And so this is also a vital part of innovating for communities, um, or, or as I would say, innovating with communities to understand um, what it takes. So this is a project that we did here in Nairobi and we're still currently kind of digitizing um, in a project to digitize over 100,000 archival records from Kenya's, one of Kenya's oldest libraries. Um, and you can see in the video, we kind of uh, 
looked at what, what does this work take? And sometimes I think we also need to be transparent about the resource, both the mental resource, the infrastructural resource, the social resources of digital work. You know, how many rows of twine, how many face masks, how many work hours, how many kilometers of travel, how many gloves, how many interns, how many tripods. And all this is, I think, is a very beautiful way of saying that the infrastructure of digital work is not just the technology, it's the time, it's the capacity, it's the items that supplement the work that we're doing. What does it take to sustain this work, particularly from an innovation um, standpoint? One of the things that I hear often when I work with museums and libraries is that there is a fear that time is running out, you know, that some, somehow, somewhere, if, if as an institution we don't digitize everything now, then we will forever be left behind and, and um, condemned kind of to the dark corridors of history. But I, I like to, to take this, this kind of fear and also challenge, challenge institutions, challenge myself as well, to think of digitization and digital work as more about quantity and quality, um, not so much about speed, around asking, it's about asking questions, asking the right questions, about having a freedom to fail and get something wrong, to iterate, to improve and to innovate and to collaborate across disciplines, across teams, across departments. We have just launched a podcast that I will share the link that looks at this kind of core questions around digitization and what we need to be thinking of as well as how do we make this ethical, how do we make this equitable, and how do we make this sustainable um, for future perspectives. And so I do see innovation as an opportunity to challenge, to dialogue, to reframe, and to represent. And in a sense, from a practical infrastructural standpoint, I think um, there's a great opportunity to reevaluate uh, metadata and cataloging systems specifically uh, from, for collections from the colonial period, um, to look at licensing and copyright and how does this fit into indigenous knowledge systems in which people own uh, material collectively. Uh, individual ownership is not, is not something that you can assign to a particular object. Um, to look at archiving and storage practices and funding and, and kind of regulations for that. And lastly, the curatorial and dissemination um, decisions that go into digital work, I think, are very crucial part. Now, I know I have um, probably um, squeezed a lot into this short presentation, and I hope to have the opportunity to handle and answer more questions in future. Um, I will share the links to, to all the work that I have mentioned. But as I, as I summarize, I think it's important to say that the kind of ways in which we prioritize infrastructure, we prioritize the technology can be very dangerous. Um, I recently came across uh, a project in which they were digitizing material from the colonial, um, I think the early 1900s, and the collections had a lot of derogatory, um, racially charged terms. And the, the dynamic was, should we digitize this material and just put it online as it is? or should we redact kind of the, the material that is um, derogatory and mention this to our audiences? And I think in this kind of dilemma, really, it really shows that um, our curatorial, our humanness, our humanity rather, is very essential to digital work, that we are still making decisions that, as I said, the data that we are collecting and we are generating and innovating is not just about coalescing or mobilizing certain views of the past, but it's very integral to, to building futures. And therefore we have a responsibility um, both to our ancestors and to our, to our peers and to our descendants to be making decisions around digitization that are, um, that are holistic and that are centered on, on, on community-based um, human, uh, humanities kind of uh, models. So, Thank you very much. I think I will end there and uh, I look forward to the next presentation as well as the questions. Ciao, thank you so much for such a, a rich, 
fascinating presentation. We already have questions coming in, which, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll turn to after the, the second presentation. Um, but to uh, anyone listening um, at home or wherever you are, do please keep the keep the questions coming. I can see how many of you were um, also found that enormously thought provoking and um, a, a excellent presentation. So now we turn to our second speaker, um, Una Murphy, is a lecturer of arts management at the Institute for Creative and Cultural Entrepreneurship at Goldsmiths, University of London. Una's work helps museums, arts organisations and cultural businesses to take a more efficient, effective and creative approach to management with a particular focus on digital culture and capacity building. We're delighted that Una is joining us today to share her expertise as well. Um, and honoured to have you with us. Una, I shall invite you to turn your camera on and unmute and um, I will hand over to you. So as Pip said, um, my name is Una Murphy and I am a lecturer at Goldsmith University. Um, I am a mid thirties, uh, white female. Um, I'm currently wearing a bright green dress and some um, green and pink earrings um, as I embrace the heat wave that is London. Um, in today's presentation, I want to do something slightly different. Um, normally I talk about case studies I've worked on, um, but I think looking at the programme and knowing that Chow was speaking before me, um, what I really wanted to do was to take this kind of time and space to almost press pause and get us to think about some of those kind of wider digital culture narratives that we often have in the back of our heads, but don't really have time to focus on because we're quite um, product focused in developing, delivering new um, digital services and tools for our users. And so what I really want to focus on is asking this question, what does digital innovation really look like? Um, quite often we think of digital innovation as flying cars and robots. And I think when it comes to digital innovation, we have these really interesting contradictory narratives, flying cars, robots, artificial intelligence, these kind of utopian visions. Um, I like to call this the Jetsons view of digital innovation. Um, and these utopian dreams serve a useful purpose in providing aspiration to what's possible with these technologies. But the utopian dream where work is carried out by machines as we enjoy a constant life of leisure feels somewhat of a stretch in reality to the work that we're doing. So in contrast to that utopian vision, we have this really interesting dystopian narrative, um, a narrative of disasters where freedom and creativity have completely vanished and we become screen addicted zombies uh, as shown in this illustration. So again, not an accurate representation, but there are elements of truth within that. If we extend that further, we look towards um, the Chinese government's social credit model and this kind of totalitarian robot state where social credit and civic control are really intertwined in terms of technology. So it's quite a high level um, analysis of some of the digital culture narratives that exist within popular culture. And I think it's useful to frame our work in terms of digital innovation in this wider conversation about the power and impact. And I think as Chow said there, technology can be very dangerous. Um, so picking up on her work and this rush to digitize, what I'm gonna encourage you to do today in this presentation is to really press pause and to think about the impact that technology has um, on our users and on the, the data um, archives and collections that we have as institutions. So I'll give you those two extremes, one where we all quit work and um, live in cartoon flying cars um, and the other where we're screen addicted zombies. I think the reality is likely to be more nuanced and exists somewhere between that utopian and dystopian fiction that prevails in popular culture. Indeed, if we look today, neither utopian nor dystopian narratives fully depict the impact of digital innovation as we experience it in our daily lives. 
So if we look through some examples of the more mundane uses of technology in their daily lives, um, as you can see in this image, this is a picture of um, Gmail, um, Google's email provider. And the picture shows how machine learning helps to filter spam from my inbox, but it also helps, to, helps me to structure emails. So we're all familiar with, with this approach now. You're writing an email and Google or Outlook um, helps you to complete sentences. It's really an advanced form of spell check, but it's quite functional and useful. One of the problems I have with this technology is that um, it wants me to be politer and more professional in my tone, um, which I like to resist at all opportunities. Next, um, we can see here a picture from um, the travel app City Mapper. City Mapper is another great example. Google Maps also works. Both of these help me to travel in the most efficient way possible. They respond to life conditions and recalibrate my journey as I move. And my final example then is Google search. On the web, my search results are improved, meaning that I find what I'm looking for more quickly, but this quite often also limits any serendipitous opportunity for discovery, that joy of finding things in the archive. So whether that's finding an article about an unknown female scientist or a local hairdresser who doesn't pay to advertise online, we can begin to see here how digital innovation can curtail how we see and experience the world in our everyday lives. The thousands of photos I take on my phone, you can see an example of some of them on the screen here, are neatly tagged and categorized by computer vision technologies. So I can search for pictures of my birthday or look for the picture I took of a receipt during my last work trip. But as you can see in this search, the technology lacks cultural knowledge and infrastructure. So here I've searched for birthday. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see a picture of my granny and my great aunt. The computer has decided that this is a birthday because there's candles, but it's actually Christmas because you can have candles um, at more events than just birthdays. So this is just some top level insights into what digital innovation versus um, the mundanity of digital technology looks like in our everyday lives. If we turn then to Alexa, as you can see in this GIF of somebody shouting um, at a voice operated system. Alexa and an extension Amazon employees are listening to users' conversations, but she, it, Alexa, can't understand my Irish accent. And so my arguments with her seem to outweigh any useful assistance it provides. Often we become frustrated and end up shouting at these technologies. What these examples show is that for me, cultural organizations sit below the line. So if we think about the examples I've shown you, what we see is a form of efficiency. Information is provided quickly. But efficiency often comes as a, has a negative impact on issues of representation, creativity, and accuracy. Digital technologies filter my life and my experience is more efficient, but the trade-off for an efficient life is less opportunity for discovery. And also it's a life viewed through the prism of those that program the machine. So I think we can agree the landscape's complicated, but for me, one way we can develop more accurate, representative and creative approaches to digital innovation is by going underground to fall down the rabbit hole and to embrace the difficult journeys. So jumping on to my next um, analogy, um, we can talk about falling down the rabbit hole, but we can also start to think about digital innovation as an iceberg. So at this point in my presentation, this is where I would normally show you some really shiny examples of cool projects that people have done. But I'm not going to do that today. Instead, I'm going to look beyond, below the line. And I want us to start to focus and value the hard work that no one sees, that doesn't get mentioned on the press release. It's often slow, complicated, difficult, and stressful. 
but it is the foundational work that creates inclusive, accessible, engaging, representative and diverse digital products, tools and services. And for me, these conversations should really happen at the initial concept stage. When we're thinking about applying for funding or seeking resources internally for a project, that's where we need to have the conversations about creativity, access and representation. So in this very brief talk, I want to introduce three tools to you that I think can help you to develop your work in a way that provides opportunities for creativity, access and representation. The free tools I'm going to introduce are well documented um, and I'll, I'll ask um, that we'll share the links in the chat so that you can go and look at them yourselves. Each of these tools follows a similar format, but essentially it allows for the facilitation of questions around data ethics across the life cycle of product development. The first tool I want to introduce to you is the Data Ethics Canvas. And this has been developed by the Open Data Institute. And what you can see here is um, a linear process that asks you to consider the implications of the data that you're collecting, the data that you're processing, and the output data. And it frames it not simply in a legal framework, so what are the legal requirements and responsibilities, but it also asks you to think about the negative impacts on people, the positive impacts of people. And wider conversations that I think are particularly important for uh, cultural organizations and public service organizations such as libraries. So communicating your purpose, engaging with people, openness and transparency, and sharing data with others. By working through this canvas, we can start to develop more robust approaches to using digital technologies in libraries and archives. What I think is really interesting here is that it takes a macro view of the impact of our work. It looks much beyond pro product development or project development and instead places our work into a wider context of the institution and its values and the wider impact the projects can have on society. The next tool I want to introduce is the concept is consequence scanning. And so I should say all of these tools are tools that I have used in my own work to develop projects with museums and cultural organizations. The consequence scanning um, toolkit um, provides helpful prompts that allow you to facilitate conversations that situate the work that you're developing in a range of different contexts and environments, but also allows, to, allows you to think about your users, both now and potential future users. And the final tool I want to introduce you to is one that I developed myself. My work over the last number of years has focused quite heavily on artificial intelligence and working with museums and cultural organizations in the United Kingdom and America, we realized that while some interesting work was happening on a project by project basis in museums, there was no industry-wide accepted um, ethics policies, practices or processes to using artificial intelligence. And whilst we found consequence scanning and the data ethics canvas useful foundational tools, they lack the nuance needed for uh, publicly funded and social purposed organizations such as museums, libraries and archives. So we developed this free open access toolkit, which is available in English, uh, German and Spanish. And in it, we have a series of case studies, a glossary um, and some theoretical um, questions around ethics and bias. But crucially, we have a series of free worksheets that are designed to encourage people to develop ethics and examine the, the social impact of projects from the initial concept stage. So ideally, we think that the AI capabilities frameworks worksheet should be completed at initial concept stage when an idea is being developed. And you can see on the left hand side, a series of prompts to help you to complete this framework. We then have our next worksheet, which is the AI ethics workflow. So again, on the right hand side, we have this worksheet that you can use um, in project and team meetings to help you work through the prompt questions on the left hand side. 
So here you can see we're examining issues of data input. Where is the data coming, co coming from? What bias is already in that original data set? So that was something that Chow mentioned in her talk. A lot of collections data is problematic, quite often um, racist, um, quite often issues of um, homophobia, class, disability. And so one of the challenges when we think about ethics in, in digital innovation is how do we mitigate bias? How do we document bias? And how do we use our platform as cultural and social purpose organizations to unpick bias and data that commercial organizations are less likely to do? And finally, we think that this work should be situated within stakeholders. So stakeholders may be service users, but they may be also people who are negatively impacted by data that is being processed that has historical biases. Engaging with stakeholders is a way to ensure that we deliver digital products and services um, in a manner that is creative, accessible and inclusive. So in conclusion, I would like you to think about how we value the process, how we engage stakeholders. I'm a big advocate that we should have less launches. We should take the money for those drinks receptions and we should use them for stakeholder meetings. And I'm a big advocate of pre-development meetings. How can you embed ethics at the initial concept rather than simply at project planning stages? Thank you very much. Uma, thank you so much. A second absolutely brilliant presentation um, and really helpful, both of them with helpful prompts uh, for where to go for more information and, and more things that we all ought to be considering um, as, as well as fascinating insights into your own work. Chow, could I invite you to turn your camera on again and unmute and join us uh, for the for, for the discussion. So we've got about 20 minutes, just over 20 minutes. Um, so we've got time to address some of these wonderful questions. If you haven't yet asked your question, but you, you'd like to do, please put it in the Q&A. Um, I can see there's a lot of activity in chat as well that um, Chow's been engaging in too. A lot of love uh, for, the, for the presentation and admiration for, for your work and the presentations um, there. But if we could, um, if we could start with um, the the questions that have come in, as I say, do do keep them coming if you'd like to. Um, so, question for Chow to start with: Is there a danger that funding bodies will dictate what will be digitised or, or when and if it will be digitised? And um, could you speak, if if that's the case, could you speak to the implications of that? Absolutely. Um, I would say one of the biggest challenges that we're facing is a lack of resource, um, especially financial resources to, to cater for this work. A lot of the work that we have and that is currently being done is um, funded externally, uh, which is great because you know it does give us the opportunity to do this work. But at the same time, without... Um, policy, without government regulations, without support from public institutions here in Kenya or in the wider region, uh, this work is, is very hard to do outside kind of external funding. And the danger that that comes with um, as well is the kind of uh, restrictions on restrictions or implications on licensing and copyright. So we do have, you, you will find some funds that say, you have to make all the material open access. Um, and, and as we know, in as much as open access is, is a good thing in terms of conceptually giving everyone access, not everything should be made open access. Some material is sensitive, some material belongs to the source communities that have never even had a chance to interact with this data in the first place before the world sees it. Um, and, and so we have to kind of ask those questions around what it means to make all this material available without asking the right questions. Um, so I would say, yes, funding is a big challenge. Um, external funding does come with different funders have different um, restrictions on how you should use the data. And it also gets tricky because a lot of this material is, let's say, national collections. 
Yeah, so I always bring this question up when the National Museum of Kenya works with um, Google Arts and Culture, who owns the data? Or like, what, what does it mean for national collections to be only accessible through kind of like private companies? And, and you know, the access question is great because all this material that was either in basements or inaccessible physically is now online. But we're also talking about heritage, community heritage. And so how do you navigate these very complex questions without stopping at and, and just assuming that all access is good access? Um, so I'm not against access. I'm not against um, private partnerships and private public collaborations. I'm not against, against funding. Um, but I do feel that people, especially um, institutions and people working in institutions need to be equipped with the questions they should ask. Um, so that the power dynamic of, we want to digitize all your data, here's the money, is also met with the critical questions of, well, what would you use this data for? Um, how long will you keep it? Where will you store it? Um, do we still own the copyright? We need to be equipping people, especially museum workers, galleries and libraries, to ask and to feel that they have a right to ask these questions without shying away. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a, a question for Una now. Um, uh, also compliments on a great presentation and thanks. And um, it's a question about how transferable the museum's AI toolkit is to non-museum contexts. So specifically the question that says for digital archives held in libraries, um, archives, universities, and, and so on. Yeah, so I think it is very applicable um, to, so for me, I think the wider application is to, um, data repositories of social purpose. Um, so whilst the uh, museums and AI network that I led looked at um, AI from two sides, so we looked at collections data, but we also looked at it from a, um, a management perspective. So ticket sales, social media, those type of things. Um, the toolkit is very much designed to work for both sides of that. And so I think because we've designed it around collections, um, I think a lot of the, the questions that we raise and the, the framework that we've created um, is useful for libraries. And so I know that the, um, the Library of Congress um, cited it in one of their publications for developing a machine learning strategy. Um, so I think um, from my perspective, um, it would be very applicable, um, and I hope that it is, but I'd also really encourage anyone, we're really keen to have more use cases of how it's been used, so if anyone does want to embed it in, in a project, um, please do reach out to me, it, it's free and open access, um, but I'm more than happy um, to get involved if people need somebody to come in and facilitate that conversation using the toolkit, um, we're really excited to keep getting um, new use cases, and it actually, it was translated in, to German and Spanish this year because we had run a number of workshops using the toolkit for German museums. Um, and we had a number of libraries there and a number of university collections that used it. Um, so we're kind of slowly building up our use cases of, of this toolkit. Um, so I'd say very applicable, I hope. Um, but if you'd like to use it and you've any questions, just drop me an email um, and I'm more than happy to kind of give you some advice on that. Sorry, Zoom is playing up slightly. Um, thank you, and gosh, what what an enormously generous offer. I suspect you're about to be inundated, both of you. I saw Chair also shared her email address in, in the chat. So um, thank you for, for your, your generosity, your collegiality. Um, Chao, um, there's, a, there's a question for you about whether you're also involving early career researchers in, in your project and, and perhaps um, given the audience, uh, the participants in this conference are also from the GLAM sector, galleries, libraries, archives and museums, perhaps um, uh, you could speak to early career people in, in those organisations as well as, as researchers. Uh, absolutely. I, I do feel that ways of supporting this work are not just uh, financial uh, and also in terms of skills and time. All the interesting work, like, like the, the work around the documentation of the camps is volunteer work. <laughs> so that's kind of the work that gets the most interest, but it's, it's harder in terms of um, facilitating 
that works. So we do accept early career researchers, we accept interns, um, we accept you know uh, people who want to use our platforms to share their work um, or to disseminate their materials. So yes, yes, we do. And uh, please, please get in touch. Thank you. Th thank you very much. I'm really taken by how both of you are focused so much on, on people and communities in what is um, headlined as digital innovation in GLAM and really underlining that you know there is no digital without without the people and the people are the ones who create it and um, implement it and have such a, a huge part to play in it. So it's, it's really um, it's wonderful hearing you both um, talk about uh, yeah talk about that just the people in the technology. Um, Una, could you speak to um, how people could help um, build up their ethics facilitation skills? Because I, I think that's an enormously rich area and people are clearly interested in this. Yeah, so I think it is a real challenge um, in terms of um, people's confidence in this area um, and being able to represent and facilitate diverse viewpoints can be quite challenging. I think particularly in a UK context, we're kind of in this weird woke kind of culture war situation at the minute. Um, and I think that actually that is really kind of curtails our ability to have difficult questions um, in meetings. Um, and so I think for me, um, I've been doing some training with the Open Data Institute over the last couple of months. Um, because whilst I developed this toolkit, it was very much um, sector focused. And I think it's really useful as um, professionals that we look at different disciplines and we look at different approaches to how ethics conversations are happening. Um, so a really good example for me is um, Google a couple of years ago um, fired one of their ethics researchers because um, she said that their approach wasn't ethical and she published a paper outlining issues with some of their data. Um, and I think that for me is a really good starting point about how um, cultural organizations have a space um, where they can have these conversations because they're not commercially driven. Um, but I actually think that in terms of ethics facilitation, libraries and archives actually have the potential to um, serve really important public conversations about ethics and by documenting those conversations that we have whether it's blog posts whether it's sharing um, at community events we can encourage members of the public to develop their digital literacy um, so that they can be more critical um, of how they use digital technologies and the data that they share in their everyday lives. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Chow, we have a, a question here for you, um, which is, it's quite a big one. So how do we ensure um, that the biases that the questioner would say were inevitable, the inevitable biases held by GLAM professionals who are involved in acquisition, cataloguing and, and, and so on, are recorded? Yeah, that's a good <laughs> That's a good question. Um, how do we ensure the biases that the professionals have, not the, not the data? Uh, okay, well, um, that's a good question because it's not, it's not something that I, I think I have an answer for, um, but I, of late I've been thinking of, about kind of um, object biographies and data, but like kind of the, the biography of the, the, the data set like the one image that you take and yes, there's the kind of contextual material and cultural material or physical kind of attributes, but also how do we kind of embed um, the different biographies that this artifact or this image has been through or contains. Um, I don't know, I, I, do, I do think that there's ways of kind of looking at this from uh, opening up the collection standpoint. Um, but it is also a lot of self-reflection work that I think you cannot necessarily, um, how do I say, turn it into like a clinical method. Um, and therefore the work of self-reflection also has to be organic for it to be effective. And perhaps that's something that you come up with either as an institution, as a department, um, and what is the responsibility around communicating that, but not just communicating, but also addressing how it has been 
um, now that you know that there's bias, how is it dealt with? I think with the so I'm, I'm, I think I've asked more questions, but yeah. And I think just to pick up on that, Chow, I think one of the things that I find really interesting in this kind of thinking about um, how we kind of, yeah, like object biographies and how we yeah. kind of document approaches to data creation and metadata around <laughs> objects and archives. One of the things that I always think is really interesting is we have to remember that the, whilst we think that the work we're doing now is correcting historical biases, the likelihood is in a hundred years, people will look back at what we have done. We thought we were really woke and they'll be going, oh my God, that was so racist. That was like so gendered or, you know, like like culture and society changes. So I think as much as um, whilst I kind of in my work look a lot of bias and, and approaches to mitigating bias, I think it's really important reality check to remember that what we're doing is right for now. Um, and whilst we might think that the people from 100 years ago were awful in what they said and did and recorded. The likelihood is in 100 years, people will also think that everything we have did is awful. So I think there's a good reality check and we're mitigating biases so that the, mm. the data we hold is more appropriate for now. But I think knowing that we're probably doing it wrong takes a bit of pressure and risk off um, and actually recognising that we're doing, the, we're doing the best that we can with the information we currently have. Um, and I think that documenting that process so that when somebody comes to unpick our hard fought work in a hundred years, we've made that process a bit easier for them than the process that we're going through to try and mitigate biases now. Thank you. They're, they're, they're both really um, interesting and insightful um, approaches to a really difficult question. I, I think the answer of how do we record them is we don't know them all. Um, but hooray, we are not, at least we hope, we are not the end point of history. We hope we're a, a point in a, in a continuum so other people may be able to come and clear up our mess after us. Chow, could I wrap two questions together? What, one is about the main challenges. So what are the main challenges with the African digital heritage uh, work that, that you do um, and with your other work, in fact? And um, if you could possibly address that alongside this other question, which I think uh, chimes with it well, which is what kind of collaborations or partnerships are useful to your work? Because it seems to me that perhaps collaborations and partnerships might be part of the answer to the to the challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just so, in terms of challenges, uh, I. I I would say the biggest challenge we have is just uh, financial resources. And by financial resources, I mean the money to pay people to do this work comfortably, um, the money to buy infrastructure, the money to have service space, the money to train. Um, I don't necessarily think we have a, a big skills problem. I think the innovation and the skills capacity, both technical skills, cultural, curatorial skills, um, are great, but we don't have kind of the, the resource to, to enable people to focus on this um, effectively, you know, and so someone will say, but I don't even have money to pay my staff to do the work they're supposed to do. How can I have money to, to think of digital technologies? And I think this is also a problem of, of thinking about um, innovation and, and this kind of digital space as the other thing. So, you know, when we're allocating funds for um, conservation and curation and marketing and engagement, we think of digital as the thing that's like the side piece and the extra thing. It's not a core part of how an institution sees itself. And so I think there's also challenges around the perception of what technology could do. One, um, that it's an additional thing, but also there's a challenge around feeling that digital technology is a threat, you know, that it's going to take away jobs, it's going to make people redundant, it's going to prevent audiences from coming to the museum because everything is online. So I think there's a big challenge around also demystifying um, and also rightfully acknowledging that while those challenges may be valid and may be real within the context of these institutions or these roles, that there are also ways of inviting um, people, organizations, communities that have not seen themselves as part of being the digital ecosystem 
into the space and asking them, what does your role look like um, with this technology in place? You know, so I would say the financial resource kind of the the alienation of digital technology, alienating people, um, and finally kind of the lack, the barrier in which people think that digital technology is not for me or it's too far, it's too far for me to access even conceptually or, or mentally. Um, in terms of collaboration and partnerships, uh, I think the, the things that would be most helpful for us are one, um, collaborating with um, institutions that have possessed collections, um, particularly of African heritage. Um, and, and what we envision ourselves is also being a kind of a way to connect people to collections, um, to help facilitate engagement, to ask questions around dissemination. And so a collaboration around collections, collections engagement, collection dissemination and dialogue, making collections accessible. Um, are very important to us. Uh, collaboration around skills and capacity building. I think that's one of the big challenges that we have that um, there's a lot of need for capacity building and digital training and thinking. And, and we're, we're still quite small an organization and it's hard to kind of meet the demand for that resource. Um, and so I was, I was so glad to see Una on the, on the call because I've been such a big fan of the toolkit of the AI uh, Museum's toolkit. Um, and now I get to actually see how it came into, into being. So what I would like to see is hopefully the development of such toolkits um, that we can develop toolkits on digital thinking, planning for digitization, digital ethics, I think would go a long way, not just within the African heritage space, but also globally. Um, if we can be able to democratize and, and demystify a lot of these skills, um, it would be very crucial as well. Thank you for such a very rich answer and wonderful to see admiration, I think mutual admiration for your work and certainly for me, for, for, for both of yours. We've got so many wonderful questions that I'm afraid we're not going to have time to get to about audiences um, and, and about ground truth and data sets and all sorts. But um, so with huge apologies to, uh, to people whose questions we're not going to get to. And thanks very much for all of them. They've been really stimulating and, and lovely to see this um, live engagement with, um, with both of us work. Can I just ask, could I ask you for, um, as a way of summing up, we've had a specific question about advice that you might give to someone who wants to pursue a master's program in your field, but perhaps um, while absolutely addressing the master's one, uh, the master's question, could you also um, give a couple of words of advice to anyone who wants to take their first steps um, in, in the field professionally? Um, or, or as part of a community as on a volunteer basis. So how do you get involved? But if you could also speak to the master's um, question, that would be excellent. Um, Unesh, I'm going to turn to you first. Um, okay, so I'm not, I'm not going to recommend the specific masters. Um, what I would say is um, I'm a really big fan of completing, recommending that students complete a master's part-time because it provides you with time and space to basically milk the university for all its resources for two years. Um, but it also gives you two years to utilize networks and contacts, um, but also to work part-time and embed your skills. So it's not always possible, but um, financially it can be helpful for some students um, because you can work part-time, ideally in the sector that you want to work in. Um, but it also means you have two years of access to resources and databases and, and guest lectures and all of those things. Um, so I think that would be my recommendation on completing a master's it doesn't really tell you what masters to do um, but I think it's a useful way of developing your skills um, quickly um, on how to get involved in things um, I'm a big fan of digital networking um, Chow um, is also very engaged in online communities um, I did my research so I started my career in Belfast in Northern Ireland um, at a time when nobody was that interested in digital um, and I did a lot of networking um, with museums in London and New York through Twitter um, but I think also now in terms of development skills you've great crowdsourcing platforms like Zoo Universe so you can develop those kind of digital practical skills um, at a time and place that suits you. Thank you very much. Chow, the same question to you. Uh, well, I don't know if I have much to add from what Una said. Um, 
I would say that I think the work of, of being innovative is also um, exposing yourself to the risk of failure. And, and by failure, I mean things not going your way. I don't mean that you have failed. I mean that um, something has taken a different turn from what you expected it to be. And I think that both for masters and kind of community work, volunteer work, um, a lot of things, a lot of time, things will go a different way. Um, but I think that is also kind of allowing yourself to innovate in the direction of, of, of what you find, whether it's um, community needs, whether it's within the history, whether it's the questions that you're asking yourself when you encounter the archives. Um, I also think that sometimes it, it is good to empathize um, with the subject, with the material, with, with what you're doing, and it kind of brings a, a more human uh, nuance, um, even in the digital space. So, yeah.